What up, Sickness.net? It's your boy Coop. We're back with another interview. Um, this time we're going to take it down to the third coast and, and, and get you with the, another, uh, another, uh, music industry vet. Um, I would like to introduce you guys to Mr. Ian Burke. How you doing, Ian? I'm doing well, man. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I, I appreciate you taking the time out your day, man. Give us a few minutes of your time for this interview. Um, for, um, a lot of our listeners, you know, we're on the West Coast, so, you know, um, a lot of people may be familiar with you, but for the people who aren't familiar with you, can you give us a brief, uh, description of, uh, you know, your role in the music industry? Well, um, I did a lot of management and A&R work here in Atlanta, and I have been fortunate enough to have been blessed to work with the likes of uh, Arrested Development, uh, TLC, Outcast, Organized Noise, Akon, Bobby Valentino. I ran ASCAP here in Atlanta for seven years, and I also was uh, director of A&R for Electra Records uh, here in Atlanta as well. And wow, that, that's uh, summing it up real quick. Wow, wow, yeah, I was. Um doing a lot of research and stuff and and um I, I I couldn't believe it. Um would it be safe to say that um maybe you are one of the, the guys responsible or or maybe you are the guy responsible for the Atlanta music scene? No, I wouldn't take that whole whole burden on my shoulders like that, but I was definitely one of the ones that that helped uh shape the the scene into what it is today. Right, right. So, um, I, I would like to go back into a little bit of the past, um, your, your early, your early work. I understand, like you said, you, you, uh, you discovered a lot of talent. Um, some, being that, uh, you know, you said Arrested Development, TLC, uh, Criss Cross is one of those groups as well, correct? I worked with Jermaine Dupree with Criss Cross, yes I did. Okay, now when, when, when you were developing acts, like what was when when you were out finding acts back? Because I know the game was a lot different than it is now, as opposed to back then. But you know, you found a lot of important talent that made history into the music game. How how did you find some of this these these talents? Were you going to to uh, talent shows or were they submitting things to you? No, back then, you know, I, I wasn't that guy you know what i'm saying these things pretty much just fell into my lap and you know i i, I did what i could to, to help them but to help move them along so you know nobody really knew who, he, who i was so uh, nothing was ever submitted to me like that um people did introduce me to other people um when um after my reputation began to grow uh Candy Burns' brother um, from the group Escape was the one who sought me out um, to meet his sister's group and uh, to to hopefully take them under my wing. So, but starting off, you know, I, I I just happened to be at the right place at the right time and connected with the right people and was just very assertive in what I was trying to do and, and as little as I can uh, as I could do back then. Uh, it seemed to make an impact, so, you know, and, and that's how it all began. Wow! So, Escape, uh, TLC, Criss Cross. You've also had your hands in with with, with Outcast as well, right? Yes, yeah, sure. Man, um, <laughs> sitting. I mean, sitting here today on this phone um, and, and and doing this interview. I mean. I just named off a few people. How do you when you when you wake up in the morning? I mean, how do you feel about your accomplishments when dealing with a, a lot of these acts that you have brought to the forefront that are still relevant in today's market uh, t- twenty odd years later? Well, you know what? Um, it, it definitely is, is. It feels good. I'm not gonna front. Um, it would feel a little bit better if my pockets you know, would have benefited. But you know what? Uh, to be quite honest, I would have, if, if you know, I, I would do this for free if I could. I just love the industry. And um, once again, like I, I have just been blessed to have been able to work 
with with superstar artists that have been able to stand the test of time and not a lot of people can make that claim and um I'm glad to be one of them what is the what is the downfall of your job you know finding finding this great these great talents and then i i guess i don't know the right word i mean uh what is, is broker the right word i guess sending them to a better position to further their careers yeah like you know what i'm a doc connector at the end of the day you know what i'm saying i'm that guy who um reach out for other people and 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 bridge opportunities uh, for people who may not be able to get to someone else. You know what I'm saying? So right. that's yeah. pretty much what I do, whether I do it as an A&R person or I do it as a manager, you know, I, um, and, and thus, you know, now it's kind of time for me to um, be able to benefit from these connections that I make. So, uh, but that's that's pretty much how it works, right? So, is, is there any is there any artist that you uh, came in contact with, or maybe like I said, connected to dots and 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 wish that you you know what I should have just kept them with me and made that impact the whole way with them, right? Um, well, shoot, you know, all of them, you know, if I could, but. You know, being a good manager is someone who uh, knows their limitations and what they can and cannot do. Um, so it all, it, it basically just came the time where it's like, okay, I've taken this train as far as I could take it. It's in the better interest of the artists that I represented. It was just time for someone to come in and do what I wasn't able to do at the time. And, you know, you always want to keep it. You know, it's like your baby. It's like giving your way your your child for adoption or whatever with someone else. Um, but you know, you you love that child and you want nothing but the best for that child. So you gotta do what you gotta do. And you know, I did what I had to do at the at the time. Right, right. Now, I, you know, I deal with a uh, as well as you have. I deal with a lot of young artists, up and coming artists, and things of that nature. Um, can you? Can you explain to some of these artists who are listening and and people who want to be managed what is actually a manager's job? To, what does a manager his, his 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 job description for managing an artist? Well, I mean, the manager really is like a, a babysitter for adults. You know, we handle the day to day um, business things or activities for the artists and, you know, just try to, you know, uh, advise and, and consult the artists in, in, uh, the pros and cons of, 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 uh, certain decisions that they may have to make, you know, and that's what a lot of people don't realize is that ultimately as a manager, you actually work for the artist, but the artist is hiring you to, to, um, help them make decisions that, you know that they may not, they may not be able to make it them, themselves, or to you know just be a buffer between them and everybody trying to get to them. You know, it's it's that type of thing. So you know, ultimately, it's like you know you're you're an extended parent. You're know, just making sure that um, that the the client is comfortable um, and he feels good about the decisions that he or she may make. Uh, and so forth and so on. That's like a general idea of what a manager does. Got it, got it. Now, um, I was seeing you, 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 you still, you, you have a development company, you're d- developing artists. Uh, right. what well, you've been doing it. Um, but, okay, is there a difference in between developing artists? Uh, cause you know, most labels, they had artist, artist development when they were early on. And uh, music ten years ago or so, and now you have social media where a lot of artists are, you know, being found online, YouTube and Instagram and things like that. Um, is there a different format as in developing an artist then to now? No, artist development is artist development, and social media is both a blessing and a curse. Um, it's a blessing because now, especially independent artists have 
that reach to get out, you know, globally and find an audience for their music, for their for their art, for their content. Um, it's a curse because, you know, because of that reach, uh, artist development, I mean, pure artist development has been suffering with artists. So you have um, artists out there that uh, are big, but, you know, they're not really stars. Their, their performances are terrible. Their um, interviewing skills are, are lousy. They lack serious um, help as it, as it relates to those particular matters, which are those particular things which matter most uh, in an artist's career, you know? So... Yeah, artist development is artist development. You know, you get in the studio, you work with professionals, um, dance rehearsals, um, uh, media training, um, uh, vocal lessons, um, styling. You know what I'm saying? All that is part of real artist development, and that's what makes stars. That's why, you know, when I look around today, there's very few new stars coming out of the game because, you know, like I said, uh, artist development, real artist development has been suffering throughout the years hmm. so as for you being a being in the, the management field and developing artists what are some of the key elements that you look for in an artist to say you know what this this is a star right here um you know what i i pay attention to who other people pay attention to like if you can walk into a room and people start to to look or to stare or to swing their swing it swing their heads in your direction um, then that is uh, a clue to me that you have a certain it factor, uh, a certain swagger about yourself, uh, a, a certain confidence about yourself that attracts people, that pulls people in. And I look for that particular character or that particular trait when um, I'm working with artists. And nowadays, it's not about, you know, how good you can sing. And everybody just feels like, oh, I'm a great singer. I can sing better than so and so and so and so. It's not all about that sometimes. It's really, it's about, okay, who's paying attention uh, to you when you walk into a room? Who looks like they want to be part of your circle just because of what you're wearing or how you carry yourself? You know, so that's a, a very important trait that I look for when deciding as to whether or not I, I want to take on a client. So 20 years later, uh, Atlanta music, you've been heavily in you're having your hands in Atlanta music. Uh, today's Atlanta music scene, um, what are your opinions on it? <laughs> I have no real opinion on it, to be honest. You know, it is, you know, I, I feel like what, what we have here is a bunch of disposable artists. You know, the songs are, are bigger than the artists. You know what I'm saying? It's hard when you hear a record on the radio and everybody sounds the same. You don't, you, you like the record, but you don't really know who the artist is. When we were coming up in the late 80s and the 90s, like, we had our stars, we had our, our heroes, like they did back in the 60s and the 70s. You know, people that made timeless music, you know, classic music, whether you're talking about Tony Rich or Tony Braxton or Usher or uh, TLC. Um, Outcast, um, Arrested Development, 112, Jagged Edge, The Brat, uh, Criss Cross, or, um, Luda, T.I., towards the, uh, end of the millennium. Um, those were, were people who could him up, of course. Those were people that made, uh, timeless music. Like, you could put on one of those records, like right now in a club. And it doesn't matter that it's twenty some odd years old. People are going to get on the floor and jam to it because you know it. It, it that's that's the that's the feel that these artists gave you. And not only will they jam to it, they'll know the lyrics, they'll know the artist. You know what I'm saying? Um, all because you know the, the the training that those artists received back in those days. You know so. Once again, you know, that's, that's just my opinion on it. That's how I see it. Do you feel the industry is oversaturated? Oh, definitely. Definitely. You know, nobody's doing anything new, you know. Or the people that, that start the trends and people start to follow, and next thing you know, you got a bunch of Drakes, Drake wannabes, you know, right. on their hooks and things of that nature, you know. 
Yeah. Um, so people are scared to take a risk nowadays. You know, people want to be safe. Oh, this is the sound. This is what we need to go with. This is the trap music thing. And this is how we need to roll. Does the A&R exist in today's the music industry? Sure. Where uh, it used to be artists and repertoire, now it's artists and research. There are no real A&Rs left. What you do is have a bunch of social media geeks that go through and see um, how many followers you have, how many likes you got to your posts, you know what I'm saying, how many retweets you got. And, um, you know, they post those people. How many um, views you have on your video? You know, so that's the new A&R. That's not real A&R. You know, because, you know, because of that, you get people like Trinidad James, who uh, gets a, a multi-million dollar deal, supposedly, and is unable to follow up with uh, that uh, the quote-unquote hit record that he had. You know, but these people are out here getting these these deals instead of the, the real artists out here who have um and, and, and don't get it twisted, not so much that I'm saying that Mr. James isn't a real artist, but, you know, let's look at it, you know, what's the last record that he's come with? You know what I'm saying? Where is he at in the spectrum of things after receiving so many accolades from from, you know, that first record he put out or, or you know, that quote unquote hit record that he put out. You know, so um, yeah. I <laughs> hope that answers your question. <laughs> okay, now you 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 were definitely mentioned. Uh, you were at ASCAP for a while. Um, for the artist who just you know he, he's just building himself up and uh, trying to get his machine going. Um, publishing um, for an artist who's not really. Uh, selling records and or hasn't even put out an album yet or anything. How important is publishing to a to a, someone like that? They need to. What do they need to to do in order to get all this stuff uh, ready? So just in case something does pop off and they don't, you know, miss out on any money or. Well, first and foremost, songwriters and producers have to understand that. You know, uh, for the music industry, publishing is your 401k. That's your retirement plan. That's what's going to put your kids through college. You know, that's when, when all the fanfare starts. That's what you're going to be able to sit on your laurels and, and be able to rest them upon. You know, a, a good song is like real estate. You know what I'm saying? The more you, the, the more you own, uh, the better off you'll be, especially if, if they're hit records. You know, so the first thing that you want to do is, um, as a songwriter, if you're in the business, either as an artist or you're writing for people, uh, you want to affiliate yourself with a, with a, what we call a performance rights organization. And um, we have three here in this country, uh, three official ones. They're uh, ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC. You want to familiarize, uh, you want to also get yourself uh, connected with a digital Rights, which is very important now because of all the internet radio stations, uh, and also uh, Spotify, Pandora, or Tidal, all the digital airplay that that's going on. You, you want to familiar f- familiarize yourself with all forms uh, of agencies or uh, offices that collect um, royalties from uh, from airplay or from uh, licensing and sync licenses. Uh, from videos, from video games, and and things of that nature. So, now uh, you said there's there's three in the country. Now, um, do they all provide uh, different services? Or no, they, they all much- provide they all provide uh, one service, and that is to collect uh, performance royalties for songwriters. So it's just a matter of you picking which one you want your you may be more comfortable with. Absolutely. You know, I, I always tell people to do to do their research, um, call and set up meetings if you can, and uh, make your decision based upon that. Please don't make your decision based upon another person's experience with that particular performance rights organization, because I think that each person has a unique experience with uh, with anything really. So, 
you know, research it, you know, and and investigate it. She was good. She was best for you. Okay. Um. What? Just what? A couple of years ago, a couple of years ago, they uh they released a TLC movie, which was a, a group that you had a lot of work with. Um. From your perspective of being there from the beginning to probably the end, uh, was the film portrayed as accurate? Oh, no, you know, that was Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that was Hollywood. It made for a good story. You know what I'm saying? And I, I learned this the hard way. It's funny, you know, because I, I, and I love how Hollywood do, does it. They, they make it as, as, as entertaining as possible. And that's, that's the best way to do it. You know, like I'm sure straight out of Compton had a, a lot of real things that happened. And, uh, a lot of this stuff was, was glamorized, um, for the viewer who was going to pay, you know, $15 for a movie ticket, you know? Mm-hmm. So that's just how Hollywood does it. You know what I'm saying? But there are things that were depicted in the movie that were definitely actual and factual, you know, but, um, it was definitely done for Hollywood. For Hollywood. Um, mm-hmm. Do you still have a relationship with, with t Boz and... and uh, well, I, I never really had a relationship with, with Chili. We are cordial to each other um, because, you know, she found her way into a, a, a group that I created. Um, so for that, you know, we're cool with each other. But um, I just spoke with uh, Tia, Tia not too long ago. So, yeah, we're really good friends. So you said, Chili, you know, she said she found out we're in a group. I mean, it's, it's documented that there was a, another member, which was uh, Crystal Jones, correct? Right. Um, and I was watching the interview you guys had did um, on YouTube a while back and about the movie, and she was uh, she was saying that uh, the movie didn't depict the way that she, she had left the group. Uh, they said she couldn't sing. Um, what was the real reason? Why well, she to um, a, a lot of it had to do with how the contracts were being handled, how the business was being handled. Um, you know, they, they weren't allowed to have someone to speak strongly on their behalf. So the attorney that they did have was a junior attorney in the same law firm that represented the people that were signing them. You know what I'm saying? So it was definitely some sort of conflict of interest there. Um, and she wasn't really with that type of scenario. And when people felt like she made the trouble for what they were trying to do, you know, what's the best way to take care of those type of scenarios? You, you pluck it out. You get rid of it. Kind of. And that's what happened. Out of all the artists that you've... you've, you've uh, help develop and bring to the forefront. Who's your favorite? Oh man, that's a hard question. <laughs> that's a hard question. <laughs> there it is. Like, I I got love for so many uh, of of the people um, that I work with, um, and for different reasons. You know, I I, I could say that watching Outkast get the uh, 2003 album of the year Grammy and not not just watching it on TV but actually being out in all of it in the audience was amazing for me you know to be one of the uh, first hip hop artists to to have a diamond project with uh, mm-hmm. Speaker Box and Love Below watching TLC you know blossom you know into these these three little hip hop girls to, to be in one of the biggest female groups in the history of music you know what I'm saying? It's amazing to me. You know? Mm-hmm. Um, Escape will always have a special place in my heart um, because, to me, those were just amazing young ladies. You know, they could sing. You know, I, I, I promise you, like, I would put them up against some of the guy groups that were out. Their harmonies were uh, were just off the chain. Off the chain. It, it didn't matter how people may have perceived how they looked. Um, when I first walked in there and, and they sang for me, I was just done. And I was, I was done. I was like, this, this is going to be amazing. So 
Um, I, I don't really have a favorite. I, like I said, they all have a, a special place with me. Um, you know, and I enjoy working with all of them. That's great. That's great. Um, that, so th- the future is here. Um, wh- what do you have going on today? Well, you know, I have a couple of artists that I have signed to me. Um, one is a, a young Latin pop artist by the name of Gabriel Arango. Um, he just released his first single and, and video, I, 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 which was produced by Brian Michael Cox and Kendrick Dean. Um, he's a Spanglish artist. So it's something a little different for me. You know, we're about to start working on his next single and we're coming up with some really cool ideas and, you know, we'll see how things work out at the top of 2016. For him, uh, I'm also starting to work on um, my other artist. Her name is Shang. She made it all the way up to the semifinals in uh, America's Got Talent with her father. And um, we're working on her debut album. We released a, a, a project. I don't want to call it a mix CD or anything like that, but it was a, a free project that we dropped on uh, via her a website, and um, you know, caught people's attention. You know. And um, now we're ready to go into uh, full production on the um, on her project, you know. And I'm also dibbling and dabbling into film and television now. The the eye has turned to Atlanta. There's uh, uh, over a hundred projects that were shot here last month uh, between the film and television joints, and um, people are definitely looking at Atlanta as being. You know that that new spot where uh, a lot of work is going to be done, and I want to try to capitalize off of that as well. Is this uh, the animate? Is this, like I read something about an animated TV show? Is this what you? Yeah, you know, I, I I definitely want to touch. I have a couple of animated properties that I share um, with someone. Um, those are in the vault right now, but I definitely want to get into animation and um 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 production and stuff like that uh of TV shows and and potentially films as well uh and I'm also getting into the whole tech thing I work for a tech company called U42 based out of Cumming Georgia they uh build mobile gaming apps for the uh cell phones and uh on the the uh pad the devices and um you know i'm helping them with developing a social media platform for the entertainment business which they plan on launching in 2016 as well so you know that's a whole new field for me you know i'm not a technology i'm not technologically inclined um but um they're used for me uh they, they didn't hire me for the tech part of it they hired me because of what they felt like I could bring to the table with my wealth of knowledge, connections, and uh, my tenure in business. Is reality TV good for for music? Well, I, you know, we've seen the the pros and the cons of that. That obviously, it, <coughs> excuse me, it worked very well for Tam Michelle. You know what I'm saying? She was able to get where she has had problems getting her singing career off the ground in the past. Uh, her involvement with Love and Hip Hop and eventually her own show uh, has helped catapult her into at least getting onto the charts. You know what I'm saying? But then you have other situations that just work for, you know, TV. You know, you have other artists that try. And they're just not taken seriously because of everything else surrounding them, all the drama and everything like that that surrounds them, you know. So, um, you know, the only reality TV show that I felt like really worked in the artist's favor, well, not necessarily in a favor, but at least it, it launched quite a few artists, is uh, American Idol. Uh, other than that, you know what I'm saying? Look, you get your few minutes on the big, on the, on the little screen, on the idiot box. You take advantage of that. You, you go out there, you make it work for yourself. Okay. So you, so you would direct one of your artists if they had an opportunity to, to, to be on a reality show. You would direct it. 
No, yeah, no, not necessarily not. It would all, it would, it would all depends on the type of reality show it was. You know, because if if it's a show that's digging into he his or her love life and and the drama that he or she may have with someone else, other than focusing on the music that they're creating, it may not be good for my artists. You know what I'm saying? And those reality shows, they don't pay a whole heck of a lot. It, you know, it gives you a platform. You know, and you can get some hosting gigs out of it, but that doesn't mean that you're going to sell records. So I would have to be very cautious as to you know, who I put on to a, a reality show and why. Got it, got it. Man, um, what is your most memorable experience in in your career today? No, man, so many of those, too. You know, so many of those. I, I, one, I'll just name one of them, you know, but as I name this one, another one will pop up in my head. But um, there was a time when I was uh, working alongside of um, Patrick Sleepy Brown, and um, this was right before Organized Noise was um, uh, created. Um, and we were in the studio. We were at Doppler Studios, and I was sitting in the break room, you know, and in the actual studio, L.A. Reid, Babyface, and Daryl Simmons were working on the soundtrack to the movie Boomerang and they were actually working on uh the duet between uh that that uh eventually became between uh Babyface and uh Tony Braxton but I uh, I believe that it was originally written with the hopes that um uh, Miss Anita Baker would do the record. Um so sitting outside of the studio, you know what I'm saying? It's like, you know, I'm waiting because really I was driving uh Sleepy Brown around. I was a driver. Uh, but to have um, L.A. Reid come out of the studio and say, hey, man, you know, come on in, come in the studio with us, we're going to come vibe out. That was just, like, awesome to me because, you know, it's like, you know, they were, they were the, the music guys here in Atlanta, especially on the pop urban scene. So, you know, it, it was just crazy. I'm sitting there and I'm watching the song that became a big Grammy Award winning hit. Um come to life, you know, with, with them singing and playing. That was, like, really a, a, a strong moment. Another another one was meeting, you know, my, my the people that I uh, listened to growing up. You know, I, I met Barry Gordy, who, you know, my idol, you know, meeting him on several occasions and being able to talk with him. Uh, Rick James, right before he passed, the Commodores. Um, uh, one of the... Uh, Supremes, I don't know which one it was that she wrote the book Green Girls. I'm trying to think of what her name is. It's just sad that I can't remember. And then there was a time that you know my all-time favorite, you know, came over to uh, uh, a party that we were doing for Left Eye, uh, her thirtieth birthday party. Prince came over to the house. It was just a house party, and Prince came over. It was just cool. We was chilling out the whole night with folks. It was, uh, it was amazing. So wow. I, I could go on and on about that. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> wow. Wow. That's dope. That is, that is, that is dope. Um, being that you mentioned these, all of these, these great R&B talents, um, R&B music today, uh, it's white. It's white. <laughs> is, uh, is that what it is? That's white. Uh-huh. You got Ariana Grande. You got, um, Sam Smith, you got Adele, you got Justin Timberlake and Justin Bieber, um, uh, Robin Thicke, yeah, you know, wow, this white now, mm. and, and they're making mm. more money doing it. Really? That's wow, it. wow, wow, man. Um, for the up and coming artists today, um. We can give them one nice gem to to help them out with their movement. What would it be? The you know, research, you know, is educate yourself. You know, learn learn the ins and outs of the business that you're trying to get into. You want to be a doctor, you go to med school. You want to be a lawyer, you go to law school. Educate yourself about the business. That's it. You know, there are books out there that you can get. 
on your your pads or your uh you can get hard copies um you know or you can go to a library still there's still libraries out there that you can go out and grab these books and read and learn about the the ins and outs the do's and don'ts of this industry that you want to be a part of so you won't be on one of these shows later on talking about how somebody took advantage of you took your money and made you feel real bad you know and, and now you're working second shift at McDonald's. So my, my, the one thing that I always like to tell people I feel is the most important thing is to educate yourself about the business and and, and about uh, become a music historian as well. You'd be surprised at how many of these people want to be artists and they don't know nothing about, you know, contemporary artists of the past. Right. You know, well, you know yeah. that, and that's one of the reasons why we have so much garbage on the radio today. Because nobody's doing their homework. No. Nobody. It's just that they, they want to be a star. I want to be a star. That's it. Man, man. I don't, I don't want to take up too much of your time, and I appreciate it. You gave us a lot of gems. Um, do you have any last words for the listeners? You know, um, follow your heart. Follow your, your, your dreams. You know what I'm saying? Follow your passion. You know, and um, don't give up. You know, you go into this thing with a plan B. You're setting yourself up for failure. You know, put your mind to it and achieve your goals.